In this video, we'll be talking about dysfunction of the immune system and cancer. In this electron photograph, we can actually see here a cancer cell. This is a specific type of cancer cell called a HeLa cell, uh, named after Henrietta Lacks, from whom this cancer was taken. And we'll learn more about her um, in this course and the controversy that surrounds the use of these cells. So sometimes your immune system goes haywire. And when that happens, there's a number of different kind of problems that can occur. We're going to be focusing in this talk on three of them. Autoimmunity. Auto means self, self-immunity, where your body is attacking your own healthy cells. We'll also talk about allergies, where your body is attacking things that are harmless, making a mistake thinking that these things are a threat. And then we'll get into cancer, where your own body cells are growing out of control. And there are different things that can lead to an increased chance of cancer, which we won't focus too much on, but we may mention um, as a side note. So basically, you want to make sure that your immune system is fighting off infection, but not overactive. If it's overactive, you might start to fight off things that you shouldn't. And if it's underactive, well, cancer is going to be able to spread more easily and avoid detection. So it's an important balance to have. What are allergies? So as I mentioned, an allergy is due to your immune system responding against a foreign substance that's harmless. And normally, our bodies don't do this. For example, we could eat all kinds of foreign things, uh, and our body just absorbs them and digests them. But in some cases, people have food allergies. Or in this picture over here, you have a pollen allergy. There's many different types of allergies. <clears throat> Allergens, that's the name given for an antigen that causes, in some individuals, an allergic response. Down here, this QR code you can scan with your phone. I'm also going to actually show this video this time, talking a little bit more about allergies and how we can treat some of the symptoms of allergies. An allergy is an overreaction of the immune system to a normally harmless substance called an allergen. Common allergens include pollen, animal dander, down feathers, mites, chemicals, and a variety of foods. On first exposure, the inhaled allergen enters the mucous membrane lining the nasal passages, where it is taken up by the antigen-presenting cell, which presents it to the T cells. These T cells activate the B cells to release substances called IgE antibodies against the allergen. These IgE antibodies sit on the surface of the mast cells. The mast cells have granules containing chemical mediators like histamine and prostaglandins, etc. On exposure, the allergen binds to the IgE antibodies present on the mast cells, cross-linking them. This results in the release of histamine, prostaglandins, and other mediators into the surrounding tissue. These mediators cause dilation of the surrounding blood vessels and increase their permeability. This results in the nasal stuffiness, sneezing, and mucus discharge of allergic rhinitis. Antihistamines work by blocking the action of histamines at its receptors and thus decreasing the body's reaction to the allergen. So as the video mentioned, the initial part of an allergic reaction is this sensitization step. Sensitization is making it so that your body actually can respond against this allergen. So it's a step here where these antibodies are going to attach to the surface of the mast cell. That's the sensitization step. Antibodies attaching to these mast cells. But let's go through this again just to make sure we all have a good understanding of this process. So here there's an allergen, in this case a pollen grain, that gets into your body, gets into the bloodstream, and an individual's immune system makes a mistake. Their plasma cell, a specific type of B cell, 
begins to produce antibodies against that harmless foreign antigen. Some of those antibodies attach to the surface of the allergen, others attach to the surface of a mast cell, which is filled with a whole bunch of histamine and other chemicals. We'll just focus on the histamine. That's the sensitization step there. So now, if you have future exposures, we call that secondary exposure, any future exposure, not just the second time, now you have an allergic response. So the allergen now binds to the antibody that's attached to the mast cell. That acts as like a key, opening up the mast cell to release histamine. Histamine, as the video said, causes two main things, which we learned about previously with inflammation. It causes dilation of blood vessels, so they get wider, and increased leakiness. And that's where you get all the symptoms associated with allergic responses. So moving on from allergies to autoimmunity. Again, autoimmunity means self-immunity. It's where your immune system is making a mistake and beginning to attack some of your own normal self tissues. And this is something that is more common in women than in men for reasons we don't understand. And we haven't figured out a way to be able to currently reprogram the immune system, but we're undergoing some research to try to figure out how to do that, to correct this problem. There you can see here over 100 different kinds of autoimmune disorders. We're going to focus on just a small sampling of these just to get an idea. Um, these are the three that we'll focus on. Rheumatoid arthritis, type 1 diabetes, and MS, multiple sclerosis. Each of these affects a different part of the body. So type 1 diabetes, remember type 1 diabetes is where not enough insulin is being produced. And the most common cause of this is autoimmunity, where your immune system makes a mistake and it begins to attack and kill these cells that are part of the pancreas that produce insulin. Uh, when that happens, then you can develop type 1 diabetes. There are other causes, however, besides just this. In rheumatoid arthritis, this is the case where your body begins to attack cartilage, cartilage in your joints. And cartilage acts as a pad to protect um, your bones, prevent them from rubbing on one another and eroding. It also helps to hold your bones in place so they don't slip and slide at a joint. What we can see here is in rheumatoid arthritis, where your immune system makes a mistake and begins to attack and destroy this cartilage. Now, your bones can start to erode from rubbing on one another and also slip out of place. So it can be very debilitating, especially in the hands where you really get to a point where you can't even use your hands anymore. It's fairly common. You see here, there's 2.1 million Americans that are affected by it, and 75% of those are women. The last autoimmune disease that we'll talk about here is MS. MS is short for multiple sclerosis. And without getting into too much detail, your nerves, many of them, are lined with a layer of insulation, and that insulation is called myelin. Insulation surrounding your nerves, just like the insulation surrounding wiring in uh, a wall, helps that electrical signal to travel quickly in one direction. If that insulation gets destroyed, in this case by your immune system making a mistake and attacking it, now that signal moves a lot slower. <clears throat> and eventually it can get slow enough the signal to breathe is not happening fast enough, and you asphyxiate. You don't get enough oxygen in the body. We currently have no cures for any of these autoimmune diseases. Our best treatments are to give you some drugs to suppress your immune system so it slows down the progression of these diseases. However, that makes you more susceptible to other infections, and it's harder for you to get better from them. So there's some trade-offs for sure. <clears throat> Moving on next to immunodeficiency diseases, or immune deficiencies, weaknesses in the immune system. If there's part of your immune system that's weak, 
or that is missing a certain part, that means that now it's easier <clears throat> for infections to get in and cause trouble. It's harder for you to prevent that from occurring. We'll only focus on one example of a disease that is an immune deficiency and it's caused by this particular virus, HIV. HIV is the virus that can lead to an immune deficiency. It's short for human immunodeficiency virus. It changes extremely rapidly. Up to this point, we've been unable to create a vaccine for it. Um, there's been lots and lots of struggle. There are some promising ones out there that may be on the market in the next you know, five to 10 years, maybe longer. Um, but currently we have no successful vaccine for HIV because it changes so quickly. It mutates more than a million times faster than most other genes found in other organisms. I mean, it's changing its appearance so quickly that it can be hard for us to develop a vaccine that recognizes this part that isn't changing. <clears throat> so with HIV, there's this general progression if there's no treatment given. You have what's called an acute infection, uh, the first two to three months. And we'll talk about what happens there in a little bit. Then you can have this latent period, also called the chronic phase, where the virus is still there, it's just not necessarily multiplying and spreading up until a certain point when it usually reactivates. And then it might wipe out part of your immune system, leading to AIDS, which we'll also talk about. With no treatment, usually one to three years after AIDS, the individual succumbs not to AIDS itself, but to secondary infections, which we'll also talk about. Here is a QR code for a video we're about to watch. So I'll show you the video, but you're also welcome to come back and look at it again um, on your own or on your phone. When a virus winds up inside the body, it's usually met with a furious onslaught from the immune system. White blood cells immediately respond by releasing antiviral proteins, attacking infected cells and recruiting backup. Usually, this is enough. But there's one virus that pushes the immune system beyond its limits, HIV. HIV infects one of the immune cells that is central to the body's response to pathogens, the helper T cell. First, the virus attaches and enters. Once inside, the virus moves towards the nucleus along with its enzymes and genetic material. One of these enzymes, reverse transcriptase, converts the viral RNA into a length of DNA, which inserts into the cell's genome, forcing the cell to spew out HIV proteins and genetic material to make new copies of the virus. These new viruses escape the cell to infect others. HIV levels rise rapidly in the body. But the immune system doesn't go down without a fight. Inside infected cells, antiviral proteins called restriction factors work to shut down virus production, whilst others stop the virus from escaping the cell. Outside, white blood cells called B cells produce neutralizing antibodies, which bind to surface spikes on HIV particles and stop them entering healthy helper T cells. The greatest assault comes from killer T cells and natural killer cells, which seek and destroy infected cells directly. They release a protein called perforin, which punctures the infected cells, allowing enzymes to be injected, triggering auto-destruction. For a while, the defense holds and virus levels drop. But HIV begins its counterattack. It disables the cell's antiviral proteins, allowing new virus particles to leave the cell. It also constantly mutates inside the cell to evade detection. The immune system can't fight what it can't see. Eventually, the immune system wears itself out. Killer T cells activated for too long become exhausted and no longer respond to infection. Also, the body loses the ability to make new helper T cells to replace those killed in the fight. And as a result, their numbers plummet. Ultimately, the body becomes immunodeficient and this condition is known as AIDS. Without treatment, exposure to otherwise harmless microbes can be fatal. We still have no way of eliminating HIV from the body completely. There is no cure, and hidden reservoirs of HIV will rebound if treatment stops. 
but treatment with antiretroviral drugs can swing the balance, allowing the immune system to recover from battle and live to fight another day. So let's go ahead and go through this um, together. So as mentioned, the initial phase of an HIV infection is called the acute phase. Where HIV actually goes inside and infects a number of our white blood cells. The only one that you'll be asked to know for testing purposes, and that's the most important one, is the helper T cell. This gets infected with HIV. And so what happens is your immune system responds by destroying the virus particles itself, but also destroying the infector, infected HIV, um, HIV infected helper T cells. And initially, within about the first 24 hours, it destroys about 99% of that virus. But all it takes is a small amount of it to survive, to progress to this chronic or latent phase, where the virus is going to lie dormant, in some cases for up to 10 years or even longer. And at some point, they get activated again, and they start to infect other cells, and your immune system destroys those infected cells. And then more cells are made, more get infected, um, your body destroys them back and forth, back and forth. And many times, or most of the time, without some sort of treatment, the virus number climbs to a point like the video mentioned, where it gets so high and the helper T cell level gets so low it can't recover. It's depleted. Now, when you've gone from that point, where you now have almost no helper T cells, you've gone from just having an HIV infection to having AIDS. So AIDS is actually the immune deficiency. AIDS stands for acquired immune deficiency syndrome. And so if you progress to this stage, because you don't have the helper T cells, because they're gone, you are no longer able to activate B cells or other T cells. And so you've effectively, you've lost your whole adaptive immune defenses. They're all gone. And so nobody dies from AIDS. AIDS doesn't kill people. What happens is secondary infections, like common pathogens, that most of us who are healthy would be able to fight off relatively easily because they're missing their adaptive defenses, these secondary infections can become deadly. And that's what leads to, to death in the case of individuals with AIDS. One other thing to point out is that you can't transmit AIDS from one person to another. HIV, the virus can be transmitted, but AIDS cannot. AIDS is something that develops in an individual due to HIV destroying that helper T cell population or getting it down to a very low level. So what are we doing or what can we do to try to help individuals who have HIV? So because a vaccine is not currently on the market, current therapies are involved in helping to increase the length and quality of life. So there's a variety of names for this, but one thing that we call it is antiretroviral therapy or ART therapy. We're use, using like a drug cocktail, a variety of drugs that all hit HIV in different ways to prevent it from being able to copy itself or get into cells or make the proteins it needs, etc. And what this does is these drugs help to keep the number very low and prevent the helper T cell population from getting destroyed. One thing that is um, fortunate is that the tests that we have for HIV are very, very specific and they can detect even small amounts of HIV. It doesn't mean that HIV is not there if you can't detect it. There could be really, really a few particles like hidden inside of cells, but what science has shown us is if our tests don't detect it, or our sophisticated tests can't detect it, it cannot be transmitted from that person to another one. So by taking these drug cocktails, and if you have shown you can't um, find it when they test for it, then science has shown us that can't be transmitted from one person to another. So undetectable means untransmittable. 
So HIV and AIDS is t tough enough without some of the social stigmas that also accompany it. A lot of people, if they hear someone has HIV or AIDS, they want a five foot radius away from them. They don't want to be anywhere near them. They're paranoid about getting sick and infected. And so let's talk about um, how we can avoid being that person and to see what actually is a threat in terms of transmission of HIV. So here are the three ways that HIV can be transmitted, <clears throat> three primary ways, um, through sexual contact, that's the main way. Um, in certain communities like drug using communities, uh, sharing needles to inject drugs. And also from mother to baby during the pregnancy, um, that's relatively rare. Uh, it's more common during birth or during, during breastfeeding. So HIV cannot be transmitted through the air, through the water, saliva, sweat, tears, um, closed mouth kissing. The reason I say closed mouth kissing is because with uh, deep kissing or French kissing, whatever you want to call it, uh, if there are small cuts in your gums, which there usually are, there's a very small chance that there could be a blood-to-blood -blood transmission, which could then transmit HIV. Um, insects and pets can't transmit it, so a mosquito bites someone with HIV and then bites you, it won't be transmitted. Because unlike malaria, which mosquitoes can transmit, HIV does not go into the saliva of the mosquitoes. And so when it bites a new person, it doesn't come back out because it's in the stomach of the mosquito instead. Sharing toilets, food, drinks, none of those will transmit HIV. So what fluids do transmit HIV? Well, I mentioned blood, right? blood to blood. Um, breast milk. So breastfeeding, if you have HIV, you're advised not to breastfeed if you can uh, possibly avoid it. Semen, fluids from the vagina and also in the rectum. Those can all transmit HIV, but only through certain avenues. For example, if semen were to get on the skin, it wouldn't be able to transmit unless there were cuts in the skin. Same thing with breast milk or blood or any of the other fluids. So there's gotta be an entry point to get into um, the body, usually into the bloodstream. And some are more likely than others to be able to transmit, um, due mainly to the ease at which HIV can get into the bloodstream in those areas. So, um, for example, it's much more common for a man to transmit HIV to a woman than vice versa, because the penis, um, it's a lot harder for HIV to get in that way, versus the vagina when intercourse occurs. Um, there can be these real small um, micro fissures that form in the walls of the vagina. And HIV can then get in that way. Um, and the rectum is even more delicate than the vagina. It doesn't have lubricants, so it can have these tears much more frequently or easily. That's a more common entryway um, through, through the rectum if, you know, that's um, where HIV is encountered. So moving away from HIV now to, to cancer. The, to finish up this immune system dysfunction topic. So what is cancer? Well, I said before that cancer is where your own cells begin to divide out of control and they can start to invade or essentially take over nearby tissues. And we'll talk about how in some cases they can spread to far away um, parts of the body. And when they spread to far away parts of the body, they'll often travel through the bloodstream or your lymphatic system. Um, here's a picture of a woman, um, her normal view, doesn't look like she has much, you know, damage. And here is a, a ultraviolet light showing just under the surface of the skin, all this damage that has been done by the sun. And some of these spots, especially this one up here by her, um, her left eyebrow, could potentially become cancerous, or maybe they already are cancerous. It could lead to some problems later on in, in life and advanced aging of that skin. So with cancer, what's being affected is our DNA, our genes, which we'll talk more about at the end of the course. But there are two main types of genes that are affected. One is called an oncogene. An oncogene is a gene that regulates um, cell division. So if this gene is altered to the point that it is dividing faster than normal, it's like a jammed gas pedal. Okay. But then you also have genes that are present to help prevent your cells from going out of control. 
um, called tumor suppressor genes. But if that's also mutated, that's like taking the brakes out of the car. Um, those two combined together can lead to then very aggressive forms of cancer, where it can divide quickly and form into a tumor, which we'll talk about as well. So over here, this is showing us the relative contribution to cancer incidence in terms of um, percentages and these different risk factors. You should know that the three most common um, contributors to developing cancer are tobacco use first, then obesity, and three pathogens. For example, HPV, human papillomavirus, the sexually transmitted disease, or infection I should say, and that is associated with cervical cancer. So it has a tendency to cause cervical cancer in women, which is why they recommend that women, either when they first become sexually active or at age 18, whatever comes first, that they get an HPV vaccine to reduce that chance of developing cervical cancer due to HPV infection. So I mentioned this word tumors. Tumors form when cells um, grow abnormally. So normally you can see here, cells grow and they divide only to form new cells when they're needed. So when old cells die, new cells will take over. In tumors, those old cells don't die, and so they survive. And more cells form when they didn't be, weren't needed to be replacing other cells. And these extra cells can keep dividing without stopping, forming these growths that we then call tumors. There are different types of tumors, benign and malignant. I'll talk about both of these. Benign tumors are not cancerous. They do not spread out to invade nearby tissues. However, they can be quite large still, and so they can be dangerous. When they're removed, they usually don't grow back, unlike cancer. Cancer can grow back very easily. Like I mentioned, if you have a benign tumor in the brain, it could grow so large it could start to push on your brain and impair brain function, which could be still life-threatening. On the other hand, malignant tumors are cancerous tumors. These are the opposite. They can spread into nearby tissues, and in some cases they can break off and travel to distant parts of the body. We'll talk about the term that's used to describe that transmission from one part of the body to another. That is called metastasis. So if someone says that a cancer metastasized, that's bad news. That means it spread from one part of the body where it first formed to another part, which makes it a lot harder to treat because it's no longer localized to a specific area, and it can be just a lot more, more challenging.